Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Don't forget, I have three other podcasts out there, From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday and is currently looking at every single opposition leader who never became Prime Minister. I have Canada's Great War, which releases every single Sunday and looks at Canada in the First World War. And of course, Coast to Coast, which releases every single Thursday and looks at the building of the Transcontinental Railway. Now I took last week off, as I mentioned in that update episode, because I wanted to take some time to assess the podcasts and make them as good as they could be. And I asked for your suggestions, and you guys sent a lot of them, and I truly do appreciate it. There's going to be some changes coming to the podcast. First, you probably noticed that there's no interview episode this week, and that's because interviews are going to be gone except when I can make them part of an episode or as a companion piece to an episode. As well, there's going to be more focus on Indigenous history, women's history, and LGBTQ history. In addition, I'm going to try to make the episodes more interesting, with archival audio, sound effects, and more to really take you to where I'm talking about. And with small town histories, well, they're going to change just a little bit. And you'll probably notice how they change when you listen to this episode, in which I'm talking about Melita, Manitoba. The verified history of the indigenous in the Melita area goes back not just centuries, but thousands of years. There's evidence of prolonged habitation that dates back as far as 800 AD. Located south of Melita, there are two very important sites in terms of indigenous history. The first is the Brockington National Historical Site of Canada, and this site, located on the east side of the Suris River, consists of thin, crescent-shaped strips of land that has shown three different periods of habitation by the indigenous, dating from 800 AD to 1650 AD, just as the first Europeans began to arrive in the area. At this site, there is evidence of bison drives, indigenous remains, and traces of occupation. At the lowest level of the site, there is evidence of a bison pound and processing camp. It's not known which indigenous group used the processing camp, but it's believed to be the earliest occupiers of the site. In the oldest level, there is a huge array of tools and bones as well as arrowheads. The top level and most recent period of habitation shows evidence of an unknown plains indigenous group who likely came up from the Dakotas. The fact that the site has three different periods of habitation allows modern historians to see the cultural changes that occurred over the course of 1,000 years. Today, the site is a National Historic Site and has been so since 1973. Located nearby to the Brockington site, there is the Linear Mounds National Historic Site. This site consists of three burial mounds spread over a large space of land. Dating from 900 AD to 1400 AD, the site contains complex concentrations of soil, bone, and other materials. The wealth of artifacts found in the area have helped researchers glimpse life on the Great Plains at this time, long before the arrival of Europeans. The area around Melita was home to the Anishinaabe and the Oseta Sakuin, also known as the Sioux. In later years, as fur traders arrived, a new culture, the Métis, would rise in the area. The Mandan, a tribe that primarily lived in the area of North Dakota, were also found in the area and would be the first to greet explorers who came to the area in the 1600s and 1700s. In 2018, an archaeological find revealed that the indigenous of the area practiced farming prior to the contact with Europeans. It was at this site that modified bison shoulder blades were found alongside a creek bank, and it's believed those bones were used as hoes for gardening by the indigenous that lived there. This makes Melita one of only two sites in Manitoba with evidence of pre-contact indigenous farming. Through the area, there's also a trail called the Yellow Quill Trail that was used by the indigenous as they migrated through. As fur traders and bison hunters arrived, they would follow this same trail. Through the years, many artifacts have been found around Melita, including arrowheads that were used by the indigenous. 
As with many other parts of the prairies, the bison were a major source of food and supplies for the indigenous. For centuries, the indigenous would follow the herds through the area, and as the Métis culture began to rise up, their legendary bison hunts would last through much of the 1800s until the herds were decimated south of the border, ending this way of life forever. The first known European settler in the Melita area was a man by the name of Charles West, who came out in 1879. West didn't live in a house when he arrived, but instead had a small dugout carved into the west bank of the river near a grove. Soon after he arrived, his friends James Kinley and Alfred Duguay arrived and began the area of settlement for the region. West had arrived with no guns or provisions, and some said that he was a fugitive on the run from the Hudson's Bay Company. He would leave the region in 1880 and was never heard from again, but his historic footnote still exists. From him and those who followed, Melita would grow. On July 1st, 1882, residents from across the area came out to a place just south of Melita to celebrate Dominion Day with a large picnic. The spot was also a stopping point along the Boundary Commission Trail as well. Over the years, the stopping point would be used and turned into a park after the land was donated by Norman Gould, who also allowed the annual Dominion Day celebrations to be held there. This site also holds special significance as it was where the surveyors with the British North American Boundary Commission camped in 1873. One year later, the Northwest Mounted Police camped at the same spot on their journey out west. Today, the site is the Sursford Park, a recreation and heritage area in a quiet grove right next to where the Antler River meets the Surus River. The 8 hectare site is also a municipal heritage property. At the property, you can find a large memorial arch that was built in 1929, as well as an 1885 log house and a 1.5 story fieldstone house that was built in 1902 by Alfred Gould. But what about the name? Well, when the first settlement began, which didn't last long, it was called Manchester. In 1884, when the post office was opening and the local settlers were asked to suggest a name, they suggested Manchester, as that was already the name of the area, but they were told that this name had already been chosen. A list of names was then sent to settlers to look at. One Sunday afternoon, the lesson during the Sunday school was St. Paul's Shipwreck on the island of Malta, or Melita. Everyone felt this was a good name, and it was also a name on the list, so it worked out for the community, and it was chosen. In 1886, with a growing number of children in the area, the first school was built in what would be Melita. The school was a simple frame structure using lumber hauled in from Verdon and was built for the low cost of $75. That school would serve as the main place for learning for the next six years. In 1890, the railroad was coming through southwestern Manitoba and a town site was surveyed, sparking the beginning of the current community of Melita. The community soon began to grow from this point. By the autumn of 1890, there were already two stores, a post office, a blacksmith shop, a harness shop, an implement agency, a stable, a doctor, and a school along with four houses. The Ogilvy's Milling Company, the Lake of the Woods, and the Northern Elevator Companies all opened elevators in the community at this time as well. The Ogilvy's Elevator would outlast the other two until it was finally replaced in 1956. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms, and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253.
The same year that Melitta was formed, Belfry School was built just west of the community. This one-room school served many rural residents during the pioneer era and for the next six decades. And while the school was built modest in size, it provided a vital source of education for the children of the area. On top of that, it also served as the social hub for some residents where dances, community meetings, and picnics would be held. The school actually still stands to this day and can be visited on a trip through the area. It's also a municipal heritage property. In 1892, a new school was built to accommodate the increased number of children in the community. This four-room school was built with a new heating and ventilation system, making it one of the most modern schools in the entire province. The school still exists today. Today, it's home to the Antler River Museum. The museum features artifacts from the archaeological digs in the area, a 1927 indigenous outfit, and a transportation diorama that highlights some of the unique items found in the museum. The museum also has artifacts from the military history of the community, a recreation of a rural school, a pioneer home from 1900, and a wildlife exhibit that features 200 mounted birds. There's also an old-time picture room, an antiques room, fashions from the turn of the century, and more. Throughout the 1890s, the community continued to grow, and by 1898 it had a population of 500 people, many beautiful stone buildings, and a growing number of services. As the community moved into the 20th century towards the First World War, it would change with the growing world. The first electric lights would be installed, and on May 17, 1901, the first automobile would arrive in the community. The Melita Enterprise and Progress would state, quote, A horseless carriage appeared on the streets the other day, end quote. Within five years of the arrival of the first automobile, the first speed limit law came into place in the community, limiting automobiles to four miles per hour in town. In 1903, a man by the name of Captain Hunt Johnston Ralston Large would arrive in the community and he was well-liked in the area and known for his kind heart, and he even saved the life of a man who had become tangled in the wheel of a threshing machine by calmly taking out a heavy hammer and breaking the large wheel to free the man. Of course, what Captain Large is known for is his boat. In 1908, he took a CPR boxcar, he tore it apart and used the lumber to build the boat, along with the lumber from an old house and a donation of lumber. Propelled with a large one-cylinder gasoline threshing engine attached to two side-wheel paddles nine feet in diameter and made of steel, the boat showed off the master craftsmanship of Captain Large. He would call his boat the Empress of Ireland, and it launched on the Suris River in 1910. One person allegedly asked, do you expect this to float? And Captain Large responded by painting a line on the hull, and when the boat went in the water, the water level went right up to that line. A Mr. Mallow was hired to steer the boat along the river while Captain Large would sing songs and play on his banjo to the delight of his passengers. In 1912, he decided to use the ship to haul coal, but he changed the name to the Assiniboine Queen to do so. Sadly, one year later, the ship went to the bottom of the river during a terrible flood and torrential rains. Captain Large, a legend of the area during his time, would go back to eastern Canada in 1914 and a portion of the paddle wheel from this vessel can still be found at the Surus Ferd Park I mentioned earlier. In May 1909, the community would suddenly find itself shaking when an earthquake hit. While no damage was done, it was a jarring experience for many, although people in the streets felt no earthquake, while those in their offices and homes did feel it. In a few homes in the community, dishes rattled, along with stone lids, the farmers outside the community also felt it and phoned into town to inquire if the earthquake had been felt there as well. In 1917, the community had a bit of pride to show when the SS Melita was launched by the Canadian Pacific Railway Ocean Lines. Stretching 520 feet, she was no small ship, and on January 12, 1918, she took to her maiden voyage from Liverpool to St. John, New Brunswick. The ship would be involved in a notable incident on October 21, 1925, when Chief Officer Thomas Towers shot Master A.H. Clues as he slept in his cabin. He would also shoot the Assistant Chief Engineer David Gilmore, but he did not kill him. Towers was then overpowered and arrested by Belgian police as the ship was in port there at the time. In 1935, the ship would be sold to an Italian company, 
it would no longer be known as the Melita. In 1940, she was torpedoed by a British plane in the Mediterranean, and due to her damage, she was scuttled by the Italian forces in 1941, and in 1950, she was raised and sold for scrap. In 1928, Melita was shown that she was a force to be reckoned with on the sports scene. Along with having some of the best baseball and hockey teams in the area, the community also hosted the second largest bond spiel in Canada with 94 entries. At the time, it was the largest bond spiel in Canada to be sponsored by one single club. The 1920s was the time of another interesting moment in the history of Melita. During this era, criminals from North Dakota would come into Manitoba in order to ply their criminal trade, likely because enforcement was less than the United States. Melita found that out firsthand on September 23, 1922, when six bandits stormed into the Union Bank of Canada in the community and robbed it. They had gagged and bound the engineer of the electric light plant next door, and then forced themselves into the bank and placed the two sleeping clerks under guard. Using four charges of explosives to force the vault door open, they were surprised in their work by Reverend Thomas Beveridge, who came over to the bank which was closed at the time after hearing the commotion. Told to stay away, he refused and he was shot at four times. The fourth shot hit him in the foot, wounding him. The men then ran from the bank with $7,000 or $108,000 today. Many citizens in town would say that the robbery was the most crude that they had ever seen and the robbers made no effort to hide their faces or even remain quiet. The only thing they had done was cut all the telegraph and telephone wires in the community. One month later, Edward Shearer, a noted Winnipeg criminal, was arrested in the United States, but the American government would refuse to extradite him back to Canada, stating that the evidence was insufficient for extradition. The community would have a very important visitor arrive on September 19, 1936, it was on that day that John Buchan, the first Baron Tweedsmuir and the Governor General of Canada, came to the community on his way to Brandon. The visit was quite brief and very informal. The Governor General was especially interested in the formation of the Buchan Folk Circle in the community, and the day was also made a holiday for the children of the area, something they were all very thankful for. As for that Folk Circle, well, it was formed in 1934 in order to bring people to the district and it would last well into the 1970s. Around the same time, or at least a couple years after, that the Governor General visited, a young girl would move from a small hamlet at the US-Canada border to Melita with her family. While her name is quite known around Canada, her son would become arguably one of, if not, the most famous Canadian in history. Her name was Betty Fox, and during her childhood through the late 1930s and into the 1940s, she would live in Melita. Of course, her son is Terry Fox, the Canadian icon. Betty would have quite the life herself though, as she is well known for her support in developing the Terry Fox Run and the creation of the Terry Fox Foundation. She would take the lead in many parts of the organization, and over the course of her life she would speak to more than 400,000 school children, tour in the country for 25 years to talk to them about the Marathon of Hope. Every speech she gave, she would end with the phrase, never ever give up on your dreams. In 2010, she was selected as one of the Olympic flag bearers for the opening ceremonies of the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics. And she would also carry the Olympic torch with her husband Raleigh during the 2010 Paralympic Games. On June 17, 2011, she would pass away from diabetes and her funeral was so large that the Civic Recreation Centre had to be used, and it was broadcast live. British Columbia Premier Christy Clark would attend. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at the community of Melita. And if you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget, you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month, just like all of these wonderful patrons have. And I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Randy Hayden. 
Doug Campbell, Reg W, Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randall McCallum, Diane Wade, Lori Ann Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke Guess, JP Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash Canadian History X. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C R A I G B A I R D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.